All right. Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm your host. I'm your guide to the next hour of conversation. And conversation is what this is about. We have a terrific pair of guests on a vital topic. Every week, it seems to me, we've bounced off of the idea of what does it mean to have academic freedom? What does it mean for students, faculty, staff to express themselves in different places and in different venues, sometimes with different technologies? What are the parameters of that? What are the impacts? How do they play out in the real world? Uh, I'm, I'm just delighted to have two wonderful, wonderful people, two great scholars who can help us explore that topic. We have Jennifer Ruth, who is a professor of uh, film studies at Portland State University. Uh, she does a lot of work on films that I'm really interested in, and I really admire that. And Michael Berube is a professor of, of English who has worked on everything from disability studies to helping run the Modern Language Association. Uh, that together they have written several books, and most recently from Johns Hopkins University Press, a new book called It's Not Free Speech. And if you're curious about it, look at the bottom left of your screen. You should see a little lozenge-shaped button there that says It's Not Free Speech. Press that button and you could take a look at the book. The book makes a very provocative and I think in many ways radical argument about what academic freedom means in the 21st century. Now, in order to get out of the way and let them talk, let me first of all bring them up on stage. So to begin with, let's see if we can put the spotlight right on Professor Ruth. Hello. Hello. Can you hear Good me? Good to okay? see you. I can hear you and I can see you brilliantly. Great. How are you doing this afternoon or this okay. morning? I should say if you're on the West Coast. Very well. Thank you for having me. And thank you to the Patreons who uh, support this important program. Happy to be here. Here, here. I agree. Well, um, Jennifer, we have, if I can call you that, we, we have a, a way of introducing people. I'm, I'm happy to talk about your work in film, but but this is the future trends forum. So what I'd like you to talk about, just to introduce yourself, is talk about your next year. Uh, what's lying ahead for you? What are the big projects and the big ideas for you? Well, as far as film goes, which I know you're interested in, I have a piece coming out on Chinese art film from the sixth generation and a Rutledge anthology. I'm also working on a project on the Taiwan New Wave. However, the project that I want to mention here, because it's most salient, is a book project that uh, I'm, I've undertaken with Ellen Schrecker, historian of the McCarthy era. Most famously, she wrote No Ivory Tower wow. about the McCarthy period. Absolutely. And and Valerie Johnson, who's a political scientist at DePaul University. We're co-editing mm -hmm. a book on the legislative attacks on academic freedom. This is what, what I call the subnational mm -hmm. authoritarianism because it's at the state level to try to censor teaching about race, gender, and sexuality. Um, Penn has, has coined this the education and gag orders, and that has that has stuck, and that's a, that's a good sort of way to refer to it. But we have... Uh, enlisted about 12 different contributors to write about these gag orders and to write about the different kinds of efforts that people are already undertaking to fight them. So that's the project that we're working on now that I hope will be out by spring, if hopefully we have various conversations with presses. Um, because it, we, we all need some guidebooks, some, some campaign strategies to fight this which is the, the most serious threat on academic freedom Agreed. since the McCarthy era. Agreed. Uh, I'm so happy to hear that. I'm a big fan of uh, Ellen Schrecker. Uh, please tell her, I've met her a couple of times. Tell her I said hi. Uh, her son, Michael, was my roommate in college for two years. Oh, that's great. Uh, very, very small. I'm going to talk to her later well, today. Let me, let me, please do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, let me bring up your uh, co-author. Uh, this is Michael Berube. Um, and he is coming to us uh, from Penn State University. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Brian. Thank you for having me and us. Oh, it's a real, it's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure to have both of you here. Um, Michael, you know, I'm, I'm going to be, I'll happily talk about your praises of what you've accomplished so far, but, but if you could introduce yourself by talking about what you hope to do over the next year. 
right now I'm just hoping to get through a 70 student class in science fiction, but that actually ties into what I'm doing next. I'm working on a book. Uh, the main title is The Ex-Human about the end of the human civilization as imagined in various science fiction scenarios. So uh, it was partly inflected by the pandemic. Um, there aren't too many uh, viral apocalypses in this book, but there are um, attacks by hostile AI, benevolent or not benevolent aliens, things like that. Um, I actually wish I were part of this project that Jennifer just described because I think, um, no surprise that I think she's exactly right, that this, these attacks on um, things like critical race theory are in fact the most, as she said, the most uh, dangerous threats to academic freedom since McCarthyism. I think Ellen Schrecker wrote a couple months ago that in some ways they're worse. McCarthyism went after individuals, fellow travelers, true believers, whatever. And this kind of campaign is trying to delegitimate entire areas of thought. Uh, I do have a couple irons in that fire as well, but uh, really? not in book form. But obviously, I think anyone interested in the topic of really? academic freedom will find that to be uh, item agenda one for quite some time. If you could, if you could just make the distinction uh, that you make in your book between the uh, First Amendment right of free speech that all Americans enjoy uh, versus the, the more narrowly construed version of academic freedom. Michael, you want me to go? Yes, please. You start. Okie doke. Um, so, yeah, we all know we have the First Amendment. The First and Second Amendment seem to be sacrosanct in, in America. Uh, and yet, you know, uh, just this week, we found that Florida is trying to uphold the Stop Woke Act by invoking Garcetti. So, so let me back up and just say all of these legislations that we are we just were talking about, We've been sort of, the, those of, with whom I'm talking about these things have been somewhat, I wouldn't say complacent, but hopeful that the First Amendment was going to be able to strike these things down. And that's not necessarily the case. And one, and we can get into that in more length, but more specifically with regard to the book, academic freedom is not free speech. They are not the same thing. It's a special consideration of the First Amendment, as certain a certain legislative uh, ruling said. Academic freedom is a special consideration. But academic freedom is specific to university. It's the uh, collective exercise of vetting each other's work, of uh, peer review, these kinds of things to say, what's the search for truth and how do we maintain our disciplinary mechanisms to uphold it in a, in a legitimate and defensible way. Free speech, you can say whatever you want. The legitimacy of the country relies on our being able to crit criticize anyone, any ordinary person being able to criticize the powers that be. Academic freedom is a, is a different thing. Um, while they overlap and while they're both critical to the legitimacy of any democracy, they're not the same thing. And it, we're realizing more and more, particularly this, with this legislation, that we need to make that distinction. I think you want to add to that? I've sort of, I haven't really covered. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> getting some weird um, sort of wave interference in the background. I'll just try to talk. Uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I just switched networks and uh, hopefully this will be better. Okay, great. Uh, I'll just I'll just add to that by saying my uh, we've done a couple of these uh, sort of joint interviews. My usual metaphor is you know free speech is the ocean on which we all sail. Uh, without it, it is the precondition for academic freedom. You actually can't have academic freedom without an underlying assumption that things you can say um, are not subject to prior restraint by the government. Again, Florida is challenging that because Florida is taking the lead in challenging every kind of uh, open society freedom there is. Um, and uh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be doing that for quite some time unless there's a change in leadership. <clears throat> but to underscore what uh, Jennifer said, we rely on Robert Post's book, Democracy, Expertise, and Academic Freedom, because we think, as Post does, there's a difference between democratic legitimation which is free speech, which is my right to go out on the street and warn people about the lizard people who control the world government. About time. Uh, it's David Icke's idea, but you know, it's, it's actually believed by millions of people. But if I try pulling that in the classroom, it's a different story altogether. I am calling into question my fitness to teach anything, let alone theories of government, theories of media, what have you. 
And so the bar is much higher. So on that vast ocean of free speech, we have this very fragile vessel called academic freedom that needs to stay afloat, but at the same time is distinct from it and actually does need to have guardrails uh, that prevent it from becoming a sort of free for all. So that's, thank you. That's, a, that's one of the major distinctions of the book. And friends, if you haven't read this book, again, I strongly recommend that, not just because I'm hosting these folks, but because it's compellingly written. It's, it's really, really hard to stop reading once you get into it. Well, given that distinction, uh, then how, how, does, how should colleges and universities implement uh, a sense of academic freedom now in a way that is just and also maximizes our ability to produce and share knowledge. Go in reverse order. I can lead, and then Jennifer can deliver the she um, the actual suggestion. Jennifer, I can't hear you. I said she muted herself. That's okay. We all do it. I, I like it best, Michael, when I can sort of say scattered things, and then you mop it all up for us. Great. So if you don't mind. Okay, so I, I think that um, what we're, you know, you said that what we're proposing is in some ways radical, perhaps, but in some ways it's quite conventional and it's a request to update the way we think about these things for a contemporary era in which the majority of instructors do not have tenure, A, and B, we have a social media world in which uh, it, it, that is affecting the public sphere, the sort of paradox of democracy. We can say whatever we want, including we can say mm -hmm. things to try to persuade uh, us towards more authoritarian ways of being. Um, we, that, we have that. And we also have a, an erosion of any ability to, un with the erosion of tenure, I think they go hand in hand, an inability to think through even as faculty members, right? I mean, the, the joke sort of is that the people, you don't want an academic freedom issue to come to a trial because a jury isn't that not made up of faculty isn't going to understand academic freedom. Well, most faculty don't really understand academic freedom either in the sense that we've it's sort of deteriorated to be conflated with one and the same as with free speech. So the book is a kind of intervention into making that distinction between academic freedom and free speech and then also explaining why we need to kind of update, bolster our guardrails because the kinds of processes that have been in place since, you know, uh, AUP was successful in promoting the gold standard of tenure and it spread throughout the country, that that has mm -hmm. eroded so profoundly. And so the kind of processes of peer review, peer, peer evaluation, peer promotion, um, those things in order uh, don't happen for many, many faculty, in fact. So... And of course, after after tenure, they, they for the most part stop happening. So we would like to see a, academic freedom committees. These already exist in many places. They don't always have the same kind of charge that we would ask them to, uh, to sort of shoulder. But an academic freedom committee so that look at issues when, that come up when people are, uh, when academic freedom might be violated in one way or the other, or it might be being used as a pretext or a weapon to defend what would be more typically, because it wouldn't be able to withstand peer scrutiny, free speech. So uh, the if you have an adjunct instructor who has said something controversial that a parent or an alumni or a you know, you know, legislator has ginned up a campaign about that person could bring his or her case to an academic freedom committee, as opposed to simply a chair saying, it's easier not to rehire that adjunct instructor next term. If we have situations where we have opportunists in the public, uh, faculty opportunists who are in many ways peddling misinformation and disinformation, we can convene uh, faculty in that person's areas to, to sort of weigh in on, on whether what they're doing deserves the protection of academic freedom. So in, in many ways, what we're suggesting is just a bolstering of what should already be there, which is faculty authority uh, over our work. So the most important point I think is to make that to sort of uh, preempt misunderstandings is that we're not empowered. The, you know, the big question is, uh, who gets to say? Who gets to say what is truth, what isn't truth, what in this post-truth world? Who gets to say what is uh, too far left, too far right? Mm -hmm. Well, 
state legislators, politicians don't get to say, administrators don't get to say, we have to say, will that always be foolproof? Of course not. We may, but faculty as bodies in the areas of the discipline, we're the authorities. And that is what academic freedom is. That, that, the source of the authority is, is how you protect academic freedom. Within that peer community. Yes. Um, Thank you, thank you. I, I want to ask two more questions that I need to get out of the way and let everybody else, um, um, and, and these have to do with some of the distinctions that you make that I think are so important. If the first is the one that you just touched on uh, between tenure track and uh, adjunct faculty, uh, depending on your statistics, adjunct faculty are roughly 70% of the instructional faculty in the United States now. Um, how, you know, they lack all of the protections that uh, tenure track, especially tenured faculty have. What do you recommend uh, to, to shield them? Uh, would, would this committee be sufficient protection or should universities and colleges do more? Well, one of the things I think <clears throat> the short answer is well, unionization would also help. Uh, and we're strong advocates and Jennifer has an easier uh, road to hoe than I do because she's already unionized. Um, but on top of that, we thought of these academic freedom committees, as Jennifer says, as things that would not pay no attention to whether a person is tenured or off the tenure track. The question is whether they're doing legitimate work. So if I can back up for just a second, I'll just start where the book does. The book opens with the question, does academic freedom extend to white supremacist professors? Now, this has led a couple of people down the primrose path here, uh, part garden path. Um, we've gotten some pushback that says, well, there aren't that many as if that's the issue. Uh, or we've been uh, uh, caricatured as, you know, woke uh, social justice warriors. Our argument has nothing to do with hurt feelings or words that wound or whatever. Our argument is that the theories of white supremacy have no intellectual legitimacy whatsoever. They should be over there in the bin alongside the theories of the lizard people, the fake moon landings, COVID is a hoax, there's a worldwide Jewish conspiracy, and Sandy Hook was a false flag. By the way, there are faculty, and we discuss them in the book, who believe some of those things and actually mm -hmm. teach them. Mm -hmm. So the question about white supremacy is something that's, I think, a, a immediate moment to people in the United States. But the larger question here that, that opens on to is what constitutes fitness to teach? And that's why we draw that distinction between free speech and um, academic freedom, because academic freedom does not cover all those things. Now, some of the other pushback we've gotten is, well, this is basically calling for star chambers. It's calling for committees to vet uh, mm -hmm. the utterances of people on social media and so forth. And mm -hmm. Jennifer and I went back and forth a good deal, even before we sat down to write about that, because I think Jennifer had the definitive answer. I'm just going to say what she said. This is already going on. When faculty are disciplined for controversial speech, there's already an apparatus for disciplining them. It's the wrong one. It's DEI offices, it's H human resources offices, it's upper or middle administration, or sometimes it's cam campaigns led by donors, trustees, alumni, parents, whatever. That's not the way we want to adjudicate these things. And part of our uh, response to the, to the critics we've already accumulated is, what else you've got? How else would you like to adjudicate these disputes over what constitutes a legitimate idea other than with faculty expertise? because nothing else is really adequate. And right now we have people, especially off the tenure track, being disciplined with no recourse whatsoever, not even to a jury of their intellectual views. And so then that comes back again to that question of uh, peer review, if you will, uh, very yeah. broadly construed and peer support. And it, as Jennifer says, not that it's foolproof, but it's the, it's the worst alternative except for the, all the others. Just like democracy. Thank you. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. To which it's a lie, right? Yeah. 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 And then, and then the, the last distinction um, that I wanted to ask you about. In fact, let me stop. Let me stop asking um, because I, I'll just. It, there's just so many good things in this book. I'd like to uh, open the floor to everybody. And again, if you're new to the forum, you can ask a question uh, either by clicking the raise hand button to join us on stage, uh, or you can click the uh, question mark to give us a question. Or if you're more comfortable in the chat, let me know and I can hoist your, your question from the chat. We have one question right now from uh, our good friend, Tom Hames. Let me just bring this up on the screen for everyone to see. How has digital transformation changed the conversation on academic freedom? These things are a lot less visible before digital. Sure. Uh, I thought, Jennifer, you said you wanted to go first. This is, we actually do have a section in the book. It, it, this touches on uh, matters broader than we can 
uh, address here or anywhere, because um, let us go to the part of the book that we when we talk about this, we had more or less a Habermasian belief in the public sphere and in rational and um, uh, rational debate with reciprocal recognition among more or less, you know, people operating in good faith. And um, again, one of our critics has said, look, just the fact that there's, you know, there's always been uh, anonymous pamphlets. There's always been, uh, yeah, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, social media are not a difference in degree. They're a difference in kind. What we have now is basically a, a flood of disinformation that you know, Facebook, Twitter, et al. are just barely trying to get their arms around. And the fact that something can go viral, you know, within seconds, whether it's a cat video or a controversial remark, offhand remark, either on Twitter or in a classroom, I think is, is game changing. We both think is game changing. It means that, I mean, what, what, I hope this term is caught on. Um, we call Twitter a decontextualization device. It's very, very hard, whether it's the Steven Salida uh, de-hiring in Illinois, or a remark about all I want for Christmas is white genocide, mm -hmm. or just some toss-off remark about an election. Very, very hard to reestablish the conversational and, uh, context and intellectual context in which those tweets occur. Uh, it's, it's a challenge that we have not faced before. So I do think we're in new territory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I would, you I would right just there? add that, yeah, that, that it, this question about social media and voice, the way that different platforms amplify different voices, it also gets at the problem with conflating free speech and academic freedom and that there's that unfortunate phrase that is powerful in some contexts and disabling in others of the free marketplace of ideas. Mm -hmm. But when you have more money behind your platform, louder, loudest voices is not always the most honest or accurate voice, right? So putting things back into the deliberative discourses of the academic world mm -hmm. um, and sort of uh, bracketing the social media world seems really critical and, 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 and figuring out how to have some guardrails so that people can't use their academic uh, positions to promote misinformation and disinformation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, great question, Tom. And again, that's an example of a Q&A box uh, question. And thank you both for that answer. Uh, based on the question of context, we have uh, a good friend of the program who I don't think can make it right now, maybe coming in later this hour, but he wanted me to put this question to you, specifically about context collapse. Uh, George Station says, quote, several educator researchers, Dana Boyd, Douglas Rushkoff, I think Mike Wesh, talk about context collapse in different contexts. I wonder, how are you using the term here? Um, we don't use the term context collapse. We actually have a um, bit of a chapter in chapter one about mm -hmm. ye olde debate about context and intention in literary theory. Mm -hmm. And this came up. Um, so what, I don't know how many people know this or want to revisit it, but uh, the, the idea of cancel culture began in 2014 with the cancel Colbert campaign. Uh, and the person behind the cancel Colbert campaign had no intention of canceling Colbert. Yeah. It was a much more uh, nuanced argument than that. But Twitter is not always a, a good place for nuance. I understate slightly. Um, so I don't. I don't know what we don't have anything to say specifically under the heading of context collapse. We do have to, uh, we do take issue with the claim that um, effect is elevated over intent. Mm -hmm. We understand why people be would believe that because we, we actually cite the philosopher Harry Shearer on mm -hmm. the concept of if apologies. Oh, I'm sorry if you were offended. If right? Which is another reason we don't go to the harm argument. We saw this with Amy Wax at the University of Pennsylvania when she came out with various white supremacist nonsense. The response to it was, well, I'm sorry that the truth hurts. Suck it up. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so even when um, but at the same time, you can't say, well, you intended X, but it took on the meaning of Y and therefore we will punish you. Uh, we have a number of cases in chapter one that are that are pretty tough, uh, that require difficult calls. And that's why it's the first chapter, 
is sort of setting the table for an understanding of how to adjudicate claims when someone is, especially in social media, because as we've just touched on there, the interplay between academic freedom and free speech is incredibly complex, very hard to parse. If I can just cut to the chase on it, basically professors have more protection for what they say on Twitter if they don't know what they're talking about. Then they're speaking as citizens. When they start to speak as experts, then they have less protection because the, the thought is that if you're an electrical engineer who denies the Holocaust, you're a crank. But if you're a historian who dies, denies the Holocaust, you're, you're obviously prima facie unfit. So that's the reason we, we took some pain to try to establish what, what kind of um, weight should we give to context and intention where it's not just another uh, literary theory debate in critical inquiry from 1977, but something that we see play out every single day, usually in social media. Well, that was, uh, thank you. Uh, George always asks really deep questions uh, and I hope he can uh, uh, come in and, and follow that up. But that was, the, that was the other distinction, by the way, that I wanted to get at earlier that you made between the professional speech in professional context, like a scholarly speech on their own topic versus on social media talking about uh, whatever. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to add to that as well? Okay. Uh, more questions are coming up and I want to give everyone a chance to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, bash them around. So here comes a question. Uh, this is from David Hull. The disgraced and former professor Jordan Peterson strongly claimed academic freedom in his refusal to use non cisgendered pronouns while tenured at the University of Ottawa. What is your take on this? My take on this is worked out in part uh, by working closely with uh, my friend Valerie Johnson at DePaul University, who is very active in, like me at Portland State at DePaul, she's very active in shared governance and faculty senate kinds of committees. She also has a much stronger background in diversity and equity and, and works with her diversity and equity office much more closely. I worked with the diversity and equity office as a union steward who would come with faculty yeah, yeah. who were being investigated for various things. But so yeah. what Valerie Johnson and I increasingly argue, and it's very consistent, I think, with the values and premises of Michael and my book, is that these things can't be uh, legislated by DEI offices. They have to have buy-in on campuses with shared through shared governance with faculty. So what I would like to see, and what I what I would like to see on campuses is for faculty senates. There's two there's two things here. There are unsaid rules that faculty are violating that then get them investigated by DEI offices, but that mm -hmm. have not been actually publicly stated in a way that faculty even understand that these rules exist. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. very problematic. Uh, and then the second thing is that if it's a, it's a shared values kind of thing, if faculty, faculty on each campus and different campuses, Brigham Young might have a very different take on mm -hmm. this Portland State, but mm -hmm. faculty on campuses say, it's our, it should be our practice. We sort of collectively will vote on this, right? We'll vote on this. But we believe that you should respect the pronouns that any particular person asks to be identified with. And so we're going to pass a res we're going to pass a resolution about this. It's going to be the standard practice. And if you violate it, you, there will be repercussions. So at Penn State, there is a policy on this. And yeah, you're supposed to respect people's pronouns. Now, I'm, I just turned 61, so I, I don't understand these kids and their pronouns. Uh, but the point is that it's not my thing to get. And I watched a colleague, this actually happened in real time on Facebook. I was sitting there fascinated. A colleague of mine said, I don't really understand what dead naming is. Uh, can someone explain to me why that's an issue? Mm -hmm. And as this unfolded, he was a little older than myself. He said, oh, I think I get this. If there were sports writers by the mid to late 60s who were still calling Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay, that would tell me everything I needed to know about that person. And that, good. That's not a bad That's not a bad analogy. In fact, the more you uh, no. go down that rabbit hole, you realize then when this guy, Lou Alcindor, changed his name, almost no one cared. Ali drew all that fire for being joining the Nation of Islam, for, being, mm -hmm. for resisting the draft. And by the time it became a general thing, no one went around calling Jabbar Lou Alcindor. Right. Uh, it is also part of being a minimally decent person. If someone comes along and asks you, could you refer to me in this way to say no? Is just again, Jennifer and I actually don't fire anybody in the course of this book. We make no decisions about what should be done. We actually think their peers at their university or in some consortium should make that call. 
Personally, I don't think uh, misgendering or mispronouncing someone is a firing offense, but it's not good. It's suggesting that you're just not respecting someone's right to be hailed and recognized as a fellow human. And I would just add, too, that fitness should also include staying somewhat up to date in good pedagogical practices. So if you have a more diverse, you know, over the decades as campuses have become more diverse, I do think it's within reason to say, I'm going to continue to learn about the best ways to conduct, conduct an inclusive classroom. That can uh -huh. be considered part of your continuing to prove your fitness. Fitness, which sounds like it leads to a slightly different topic than one's professional speech in one's field. I mean, uh, that's that's not talking lizard people or Sandy Hook. That's more how you talk about lizard people or Sandy Hook. <laughs> um, we have uh, we have more questions coming up, and friends, you can tell that. Uh, uh, our guests, Jennifer and Michael, are, are superb respondents to your great questions. Uh, and Michael is already doing the multitasking genius of responding in chat, which is great. Uh, so let me just bring up uh, one more question. This is from Annie. Uh, and Annie asks, would our guests address the continuum from public and school library book challenges into and through what we're talking about in higher ed? Perhaps they would opine on First Amendment audits. And if you want to, if your mic and camera are working, if you want to join us on stage to talk about that too, I, I, I'd be happy to. Yeah, Jennifer, have you heard the term First Amendment audits? I have a funny, my spider sense tells me it's not good, but I've not heard the term. I have not. And my, my initial reaction, is, so I'm going to keep it brief, Michael, and let you respond. My initial reaction is that this is very tricky because K through 12 operates under a different set of rules than higher education traditionally. And we can claim academic freedom and the freedom from political interference, state interference, and higher ed. We can and should claim that. It's what distinguishes a democratic country from a authoritarian one. Um, but K through 12 doesn't have that kind of, it's more through labor unions that it has built up. It's, it's authority. So it's, it's a difficult one. Yeah, Michael. You Although there too, Florida is like leading the way and pushing the edge of that envelope. Uh, the Stop Woke Act, um, and a lot, a lot of well, what's being passed in Florida is aimed at K-12. Don't say gay. Um, but it also had tendrils that reached beyond, as, we, as we're seeing. I mean, it, it, it never intended, despite uh, the disingenuous claims of its uh, proponents, it never intended to stop at third grade, fifth grade, whatever. And I think that's especially obvious in book bans. Book bans also have a long, long tail. I'm sorry, I got all these I got tendrils and tails now. <laughs> but you start banning things in K-12, people will not have read them in college. I mean, that's the idea, right? So, yeah, no, I think we're seeing, I mean, uh, I, if I had known I would live so long as to see the American right start rooting for Putin and Viktor Orban. Um, yep. But here we are. Here we are. Well, Annie, that's a very, very pregnant question with a lot going on. Uh, now I'm, I'm adding embryonic metaphors to the tendrils. I'm sorry. Um, but, um, but thank you for that. Uh, and uh, we have more and still more questions coming in. Uh, so this is one that we've got from um, Joseph Robertshaw. Hang on, let me just bring this one up on the stage here. Uh, what ideas about AF have come forward and grown in this book from the days of the humanities, high education, academic freedom, three necessary arguments? How would you connect that work and this? What a lovely question. That's so nice to look back at our earlier work and ask our us early to, days. Yeah, to think yeah. about the relationship. So that book was very much focused on the rise of contingency and the exploitation of adjunct labor and how that affected academic freedom for faculty as a whole. So tenure track faculty as well as uh, uh, adjunct faculty. So that in that book, uh, it is through it is through hoping faculty activism, faculty shared governance that we hope to, to, to propose something that could turn the tide on on the exploitation of contingent faculty and the loss of academic freedom that resulted from the overuse of contingent faculty. Um, we very much hoped to propose a, a track for teaching, given the assumption, given the fact that so many state universities and so many sort of aspiring 
second tier, third tier universities who decided that they wanted to be research one over the decades. And they gave their tenure track faculty the lower cl class, class loads and gave adjunct faculty and then sort of outsourced everything onto non-tenure track faculty. Um, given that the budgets were such that it was very hard to imagine being able to turn this around and give real job security, real voice, a real voice in, in academic freedom and shared governance to non-tenure track faculty uh, by simply reproducing all of the same kinds of jobs in terms of service research teaching. We should, we should at least value, if we need to have some tracks, if there's some universities that have some tracks with higher teaching loads and less research expectations, which has already been implemented and established in many places, those people need to have the same job security so that they can enter into shared governance and faculty participation around curriculum decisions or on any number of decisions that uh, running their university. So we wanted there to be a ten teaching intensive tenure track. That book had a kind of slow burn, I think, where first there was a, a really strong negative reaction as if we had said some people deserve to research and some people don't. Of course, that was far from our motivation. Our motivation was to create a tenure track that had equity at pay and equity at job security um, to, to reverse this, this, this trend that was decimating universities and academic freedom. Um, but that was the first initial reaction. And then slowly it has kind of built and there have been different campuses that have let us know that they have implemented something along these lines. Um, and so that's wonderful. And I think that it does go it does go to show our fundamental uh, stance in terms of faculty run universities and faculty need to make these changes. Now, we've been a little I personally was a little disappointed in that uh, tenure track faculty didn't take on that that uh, fight to the degree that we should have. Mm -hmm. Unions have picked it up and it's gonna be through unions that the, that fight for contingent faculty equity happens. Um, but nonetheless, it goes back to this sense of what's faculty responsibility for the running of a university and for the protection of academic freedom, which of course is at the heart of this mo more recent book. Just to add to that, I think there are any number of ways you can come to an argument <clears throat> that the people off the tenure track should be converted to a tenure track. Uh, there are any number of arguments for equi from equity or academic freedom. The Pennsylvania state system, of which Penn State is not a member, uh, actually is a collective bargaining agreement that covers the PASHE system. And one of its clauses does provide for a conversion to tenure after 10 consecutive semesters of teaching. Uh, California, California Faculty Association has something as like a, a deutero tenure-like clause for people who get through the I have the needle review after six years. So we were incorporating all these ideas, but I just want to give Jennifer credit for uh, basically running to me 10 years ago with like the wonkiest argument I had ever heard, namely that the only way to guarantee uh, academic freedom and job security for non-tenure track faculty participating in shared governance was mm -hmm. to move them to a tenure track. And I remember writing back and saying, okay, <clears throat> we're going to write a book about this, but no one's going to understand this unless they already know what a provost is. Ordinary folks who are not in academia are not going to get this whole, <clears throat> um, what do you mean shared governance thing? Because shared governance is the least well understood aspect of academic freedom. But I can tell you at Penn State, where the non-tenure track faculty, we call them the teaching faculty now, they serve on the faculty senate, they have chair of the faculty senate, they have all the voting rights of the tenured faculty, and yet they are much less likely actually to speak up on the senate floor. When we passed our reforms for non-tenure track faculty, basically giving them a promotion and review system that they run themselves, basically people would speak to me privately. They don't want to go on record. They don't want to put their jobs in jeopardy and speaking out uh -huh. such and such a thing because they don't have a guarantee that doing so, they can they can do so without fear of reprisal. Again, it's in our academic clause, academic freedom clause, our policy AC64. You can speak out on institutional matters without fear of reprisal, but a lot of teaching faculty don't believe it and they have good reason not to believe it. So we actually came uh -huh. at this from the perspective, as Jennifer says, of strengthening shared governance. And we thought moving non-tenured faculty, non -tenured faculty onto a tenure track would not only strengthen their job security, but would strengthen shared governance in institutions. Because, of course, one of the things that's eroded shared governance in American higher education is the erosion of the tenure track. Mm -hmm. So there is there is actually a through line. And again, thank you for the question. It takes us back to the early days when we were first emailing in 2013, whatever it was, uh, and coming up with the idea for the uh, first book. Um, because <clears throat> the through line is this proposal, too 
this academic freedom committee proposal also would affect it doesn't again that doesn't matter whether you're teaching on the tenure track or not the question is was your academic freedom violated or were your activities actually covered by academic freedom regardless of your tenure status so that has been an abiding concern of ours there actually is a connecting tissue between the two books well, thank you i appreciate the labor oriented answer to the question and uh, and the answers joseph thank you very much uh, always good to see someone following multiple books through um, we have, uh, by the way, in the chat, uh, I don't know if I'll be able to summarize this later, uh, Annie very, very nicely laid out what a First Amendment audit is. She gave some links. Um, she doesn't have video right now, so she can't take the stage, but there's she, she answers that question very nicely. So Annie, thank you for introducing us to this. That sounds like a pretty uh, spooky idea. Um, we, uh, uh, I mentioned George Station earlier uh, from Cal State Monterey. He asked an earlier question and he did join us uh, with a follow-up. So I think he's in a car. Let's see if we can get him on stage. Hello, George. Okay, hi, and can you hear me all right? Perfectly. Okay, great. I'm uh, in my car. I, I got kicked out of the empty classroom I was in, so I r rushed to the parking lot. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, because my class time overlaps FTTE, and so that's uh, at this semester anyway. Um, as a lecturer, speaking of shared governance, right, which everybody just was, I know. Um, so thanks uh, for uh, uh, taking my uh, question, and um, I heard part of Michael's earlier uh, response. I think I think we're good. There was a uh, kind of a stray mention of context collapsing in your intro, which is the part of the book that uh, was quickly accessible when I heard about this session. And so I got managed to read your introduction. Oh. And so that's, it was, you know, just a quick mention and, and no worries about, I, uh, I'm with you on, on your response and I appreciate that. Um, so my uh, other question is uh, actually about um, how you wrote the book, how you gathered resources and whose voices you may have included. Um, and so here I'll, if I can just say what you said, we know that to many, the thought of handling judgments are, handing uh, judgments involving questions of discrimination over to a group coming out of a still white majority faculty is troubling at best and downright obtuse at worst. And I know uh, what you're saying about shared governance. I share many of those thoughts uh, uh, because I'm in the CSU and we have a really strong uh, uh, faculty union. Uh, and, and so shared governance is kind of a constant uh, discussion with us here. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, though that argument, I'm wondering how that informed your book's argument and um, how you included BIPOC resources and uh, maybe sources in your text. Uh, and if, if that went as you expected, did it work? Uh, would you do it differently, uh, you know, in a revised edition, et cetera, et cetera? Jennifer, do you mind if I set you up for this one? Because this was, um, I have to set the table for Jennifer because it was largely her doing. We were humming along. Um, I mean, George Floyd's murder was one of the, uh, the impetus. I mean, we were thinking about this over the summer of 2020 when that hit us as it hit so many people. And of course, it was not an isolated incident, which was part of the point of the protests. Uh, and we decided to carry that forward into the question about white supremacy in the academy. The Princeton letter of 2020 followed a couple of months later, and we got, you know, we were bandying that back and forth. That's when Jennifer said everyone's freaking out about this Princeton letter, but they're not realizing that there are various mechanisms already going on on campus for trying to adjudicate these questions. So here we were, we, we originally had divvied up, okay, you do this part of the book, you do that part of the book. And I was a good deal less busy than Jennifer was that semester, so I started I was like, I'm going to hand this off to Jennifer. And Jennifer says, you know what? Uh, first of all, she put me on to something I've been meaning to read for a long time, the work of Charles Mills. And so that part of our introduction from which that passage is drawn is a sort of check. I was already familiar with the disability studies critique of the liberal social contract tradition. I had not read Charles Mills' critique of racial liberalism, but it's an interesting uh, uh, sort of companion parallel argument about the uh, structural failures of social contract theory. Anyway, at a certain point, like uh, October, November, Jennifer writes back to me and says, you know, um, we're actually uh, basically rehearsing some things that critical race theory was arguing 30 years ago. We really should be uh, showing the receipts and paying our respects. And I said, you know, yeah, entirely, right. Let's go back and let's 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 dig deep. We basically dug under what's now chapter five to write chapter four, which Jennifer titled "Who's Afraid of Critical Race Theory Today?" 
Um, so in one case, it was just a matter of uh, doing our due diligence and working in the work of BIPOC scholars that have been, you know, uh, uh, not only foundational for that branch of legal theory, but as we were watching, it was turned into a national sideshow by Christopher Rufo and the mm -hmm. grifters uh, who, who fund him. And, and so the weird thing was, we thought at first, anthology over my shoulder, that we were going back, okay, let's go back over the the early work of Derek Bell. Let's go back over Words and Wound. Let's go back <coughs> over uh, where disparate impact theory came from, you know. And at the same time, we were dealing with an incredibly uh, almost hallucinatory moving target as we watched critical race theory turned into something unrecognizable in the fever dreams of the right. Jennifer, have I got that? Yeah, it was pretty unreal because we literally had started writing the chapter on critical race theory. I think we'd even finished, you no, know, we had finished it when Chris Rufo is sort of exposed, although I, he wouldn't consider it exposed because he's quite proud of it. Uh, as uh, and he explicitly said, we're going to empty critical race theory of all of its actual content and right. put every boogeyman we can think of in, in, in its place. And so that sort of, it just, when we started working on uh, incorporating critical race theory, it was literally like, there was this thing. And then Henry Louis Gates said this thing. And then all of a sudden it was exploding yeah. in our in real time in front of us. And so it was a really surreal experience. But I think another instructive moment to speak to your question, George, about uh, how, how the process worked is that yes, there was very much a reaction, a very much a visceral reaction to George Floyd's murder and witnessing the ways in which some people were uh, treating that murder and the way in which it was it was contributing to a really ugly polarized debate in society there was that but there was also the snowflakes remember this michael there's also the whole snowflake stuff oh, and Bear's book. Bear had written a book about what the snowflakes get right and so i was on committee a academic freedom and i was talking i was sort of defending snowflakes um and saying you know well they're there might be good reason to be more thoughtful about pronouns, et cetera. And um, I was told by another, uh, by an academic freedom scholar, well, Bear is great, but he comes out of a German tradition. And that's very different from our Ooh. American tradition. Well, yeah. why am I sitting with that for a while? We did, we, we did bring in Bear. We have a chapter on Bear in his book. But sitting with that for a while, we thought, all the more pity us in America that we haven't yeah. reckoned with our own traditions of racial fascism to the point that we're borrowing some uh, insights from a German from the German tradition. When in fact we have our own internal history, uh, we've got our own black experts who have been calling calling this out for decades, uh, and yet we want to say like the Holocaust over there versus reckoning with our reality here. And so beginning to realize that there's an internal tradition and it goes, you know, it predates critical race theorists, of course, but it's a their critical pivot point. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, because one of the things that led us to is not in the critical race theory tradition, but inspired by it was Susan Damon's book, Learning from the Germans, That's right, yeah. in which she said, she, again, this is not Holocaust comparison. We don't, mm. we don't want anywhere near that nonsense. But Damon's argument is that the kind of denial and defensiveness she experienced among Germans in the late 70s, early 80s had eerie parallels to Southern denial and, and deflection. Sure. Like, we were the real victims here. Let's not forget what happened to us. I don't see why you keep bringing that up. <clears throat> and it took quite some time for Germany to come around. It took basically the post Helmut Kohl era uh, sure. before they, you know, the, the, the stumbling stones were not there in Berlin sure. until fairly sure. recently. The Holocaust Museum was not there until fairly recently. It took a wrenching, uh, really polarizing uh, kind of debate to which now um, AFD, the far right German party, is a reaction. Uh, yeah. there, it's a reaction both to uh, immigration from the Middle East and a, a reaction to facing the past honestly. And I think the parallels to the backlash against CRT are pretty clear without getting into the comparison of the Holocaust with anything else. So once we had opened that door, I think, right, Ulrich Baer, but also that whole uh, train of what do we have to learn about our own history of racial fascism? Um, again, going back to the question of how many white supremacist professors there are right now, not really the question. What about the fact that we had an entire branch of historiography in the Dunning School that basically was the academic branch of Southern Redemption 
uh, devoted to carrying out the project of rolling back reconstruction in intellectual terms and arguing against black self-government. So that's Very where sweet. it really, it, that opened the whole book up for, and also made it harder to write because now we had a lot more work to do, but also it was the work that absolutely needed to be done by us. Well, thank you, George. Okay. Well, uh, great question. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, um, I'm going to, oh, there are just a few minutes left. So tell you what, let me just thank you and, and maybe get a couple of other uh, questions in because uh, I know this has been a fascinating conversation. So, uh, so I, I appreciate uh, both uh, Michael and, and Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, George, especially for your admirable persistence. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and racing to the parking lot. Yeah, I, I, uh, the, the, uh, I don't know who won that one, but I appreciate you uh, uh, bringing me up at the last second there. <laughs> Always good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a pair of qu we have only a couple of minutes left. Uh, and uh, by the way, that's a great example of video question. Also, example of just how incredibly brilliant the forum community can be. Uh, but we have time for one last question, and I think I, I two questions came up that ask more or less the same question. So let me just flash these right after the other, so you can see what I mean. Uh, this is from John who says, I find it striking that learners are left out of the discussion of academic freedom. Why do we not advocate for academic freedom for all? So hang on, there's that question. And then what followed is all is really similar from uh, Gail Hamner, who asks, uh, can, could our guests address the impact of student as consumer on academic freedom, uh, e.g. evaluations of student pushback on academic freedom? So putting this, these two questions, put the students on the table here. Is, do we have enough time to, to tackle that? Is that? I'll do it very briefly. Students, strictly speaking, don't have academic freedom. They don't have expertise. They do have various kinds of rights to learn. That's a very different thing. But I'm leery of it because I am having flashbacks to David Horowitz's campaign about 15, 20 years ago, where he had uh, you know, the, the Academic Bill of Rights basically trying to shoehorn an idea of free expression for students in order to erode the academic freedom of faculty. It's really dicey, but it's, it's very much a give and take. The, the, I mean, my own position is that uh, students learn best when their faculty are free to teach in their expertise wherever the questions may go. Uh, and also it would be a good idea for them to recognize their students' pronouns. Jennifer? Yeah, I, I I agree with that. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of a, a one of those moments I'm in in conversations where I, I always have to see like I would love to say academic freedom for everybody, but that's actually not what academic freedom is. It's not it, as Michael said. It, students don't have expertise yet, and academic freedom is connected to expertise. Maybe it needs a rebranding of something like um, uh, faculty freedom. Um, but if yeah. if but, but friends, we've we've come to the end of the hour, uh, which amazes me. I think we just started five minutes ago, and and yet we have covered so much great stuff. Um, thank you, first of all, Jennifer and Michael. Thank you for being fantastic guests. Uh, it's just it's just been a pleasure to hear you manage to express with great succinctness enormous swaths of knowledge and reflection. Thank you, thank you both. What what's the best way to keep up with the two of you? Uh, is it through your Twitter feed, Michael, or how else? We have no idea. Jennifer's been in Taiwan for three months. I haven't seen her. And uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, I, I tweet whenever I can. Um, I no longer have a blog. Jennifer, how does one keep up with you? I, I don't do social media at all, but I do have a web page where every new thing that I write, I put up there. Um, it's not the most effective way to, but it's certainly, if you're kind enough to be curious about what I'm doing, that would probably be the place to go. And thank you, Brian, so much for being such a wonderful host. Thank you. Oh, Truly. my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, and we really look forward to uh, the, the, the work that you're going to be doing over the next year. And uh, I'll follow up. And uh, and if you're up for it, I'll bring you back. Thank you. Oh, it'll be lovely. Thank you. Yeah. thank you. And above thank all, you take care. Be safe, you two. Likewise. But uh, don't run away yet, friends. Uh, I need to uh, point you to where we're headed next. Uh, and let me thank you again for the uh, terrific stream of questions. If you want to keep talking about this, and some of you already are on Twitter, just ha head to Twitter and use the hashtag FTTE, or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events, or uh, attack my blog at brianalexander.org. Uh, if you would like to look into the past, into our previous sessions, or if you want to review this one in about 24 hours, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF Archive, where we have recordings. 
freely available. If you want to see what we're up to next, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. You can get a sketch of the next sessions coming up. And if you want to share any of your own work, please email me so I can share it with everybody else. I'm really proud of everything you all do, and I want to spread the word. Um, thank you all for a very invigorating, thoughtful, uh, provocative, I think, discussion. Uh, we may have solved some serious problems here, or at least addressed them in a deep way. Uh, the fall semester is rattling on. I hope you all stay safe and keep working well. And next time, we'll see you online. Bye-bye.